Good evening, everyone. I'm Father Chris Stubna, the pastor and rector of St. Paul Cathedral Parish. And we're here this evening for our monthly wine, cheese, and the gospel. I wish we could be together in person so we could share a glass of wine and have some cheese and fellowship, but we, we still are dealing with the restrictions of the pandemic. And so we're here virtually. Many, many thanks to those who have made this possible, our television ministry volunteers, our live streaming volunteers. I want to welcome all of you who are joining us this evening on Facebook, on our website, on Channel 95, on Comcast. We've begun Holy Week. And tonight it seems appropriate to talk a little bit about the rituals of Holy Week, what we do and why we do them. I've already received a good number of, of questions and emails about tonight, so I've tried to incorporate some of those into what I want to share with you, but please feel free to, to send your questions to the Facebook page. I have someone that's forwarding those questions to me. If any of you have my my telephone, you can text me directly, and I'll do my best to be able to answer the questions. Let's begin with prayer this evening as we enter this most holy and sacred time in the life of the church. Let's pray that God will be with us, open our hearts to his grace, forgive our sins, and strengthen us in faith. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Lord God, how grateful we are to be on this journey, the journey of Lent in which we have worked very diligently through your grace and our efforts to grow more deeply in prayer, through our fasting and works of mercy, we have worked to overcome our sins, to be more faithful to the gospel. We pray that these holy days will invite us more deeply into the life of your Son, that we might share in the cross here on this earth and be able to share in the resurrection in the next. Thank you for the opportunity to reflect on your word this evening to reflect more deeply on the teachings of the church about your passion, death, and resurrection so that we might be led more deeply into the heart of the Paschal mystery. We pray for your grace and blessing, for your wisdom. Open our hearts this evening so that we might receive your grace through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. I thought it might be helpful this evening to talk a little bit about what the church does in this very special week, Holy Week, as we know it to be. We have a number of liturgies, some traditions and rituals that are part of the life of faith perhaps to reflect a little more deeply on what we do and why we do it might help to lead us to a deeper understanding of our faith. I wanted to begin with the Catechism of the Catholic Church. In paragraph 1168 and 1169, it talks about the liturgical year and the importance of this week above all weeks in paragraph 1168. Beginning with the Easter Triduum as its source of light, the new age of the resurrection fills the whole liturgical year with its brilliance. And gradually on either side of its source, the year is transfigured by the liturgy. It really is a year of the Lord's favor beginning with Easter and flowing out into every single part of the church's year. 
1169, the Catechism says, therefore Easter is not simply one feast among others, but the feast of feasts, the solemnity of all solemnities, just as the Eucharist is the sacrament of sacraments. St. Athanasius calls Easter the great Sunday. And the Eastern churches call Holy Week the great week. The mystery of the resurrection in which Christ crushed death permeates with its powerful energy our old time until all is subjected to him. This is the week of all weeks. It is the most central mystery of our faith. There is nothing more important than the death, the resurrection of our Lord, the Paschal mystery. And so we begin our reflection on Holy Week with the rituals that are part of our celebration of the faith. Many of you were here yesterday for the celebration of what is known as Palm Sunday, but also Passion Sunday. You know, there isn't any mystery of the faith that can be described by one word or one description. There are usually many that speak to what we really believe as people of faith. On the one hand, we know that Jesus has been walking to Jerusalem. It's in the scriptures, the gospel accounts. He's on the way to Jerusalem. Another way of saying he's on the way to the cross. But that journey takes him through many different places. He encounters many different people. And along that journey, we see him preaching, healing, teaching, revealing himself to be the one that Jesus has come to be, the Messiah, the Son of God, the Son of David, the one sent to redeem us from our sins. And that first Palm Sunday, why that beginning of Holy Week is so important, it recounts the entry into Jerusalem, the beginning of the Passion. And we see the excitement, the enthusiasm of the crowds, those who are waving palm branches. And you know, that palm is significant. Many, many people love to take the palm, the blessed palm. We put it behind our crucifixes at home. It's a reminder to us. But you know, that palm is a symbol of Roman victory military victory. Roman emperors and military generals were crowned with palm branches as a sign of victory over the enemy. And those people wave those branches on the first Palm Sunday. They throw them on the ground for Jesus to walk upon as a sign of their belief that he is the king, the one sent by God to free them from the Romans, to restore their kingdom, to bring them great power, to usher in a new kind of era for the people of Israel. And it is very important that Jesus comes in not on a stallion or a horse, but on a donkey, an ass, a symbol of great humility, There is no military general, no emperor who would have rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. It's a symbol of the one who was sent not to be served, but to serve, to give his life for the ransom for the many. We bless those palms on Palm Sunday They're what we know in the church as sacramentals. They're not sacraments. 
but they help us to be connected to the church, to lead us more deeply into the heart of the life of the church. They're sacramentals. And we're going to talk about sacramentals, I think, in, an, in our next meeting, next month. But palms are a good opportunity to reflect on what they mean. They're important to us. They're blessed with the blessing of the priest, the holy water. They can't be discarded, thrown away. Sacramentals are holy. They reflect to us the life of grace and they must be treated respectfully. Any sacramentals, rosaries, palms, prayer books, they need to be brought to the church so they can be disposed of correctly. They're very important to us because they lead us to the heart of Jesus. And so we bless those palms, as many of you know from Mass yesterday in the back of the church, and we process in like they did on that first Palm Sunday in Jerusalem. The crowd singing Hosanna, Hosanna to the Son of David. Holy, holy, holy. We know those words because we pray them at every Mass right before the Eucharistic prayer. They've been incorporated into the life of the church because they're so important to us. Hosanna to God in the highest. And we read from the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, and Luke about that preparation that Jesus asked for to begin the Passover in Jerusalem. Each of those accounts has kept that story alive for all generations. The preparation of the upper room for the gathering of the Passover meal, where the Eucharist will be confected, the priesthood inaugurated, where Jesus will offer his life and remain with us forever through the Holy Eucharist. We wear red on Palm Sunday. The church is decorated in red because it's a sign of the passion, the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Palm Sunday, but Passion Sunday. We read from the account of the gospel of the journey of the cross, the passion of our Lord. The account in Matthew, Mark, Luke, every three years we read those three accounts. The Passion in the Gospel of John is only read on Good Friday. But all four Gospels recount for us what was most important in the life of Jesus. Willingly going to his death, laying down his life for our salvation, and we read that passion. Different details in each of the accounts, but the main part of the passion remains the same. Jesus being betrayed by Judas, one of his own, taken before the Sanhedrin, the religious leaders of the time, and condemned to death, sent to Pilate, the Roman governor, who is troubled or washes his hands and sends Jesus to his death. But most importantly, Jesus himself, who is in control of everything that happens, willingly, obediently laying down his life out of love for the redemption of our sins. Passion Sunday begins this most holy week when we're invited to walk the walk of Jesus, to carry our cross, to join our lives and our sufferings to the very passion of Jesus. There are a couple of rituals in Holy Week that I wanted to mention because they can occur at different times. They're not uh, 
particularly assigned to one day in Holy Week, but they generally happen in Holy Week. One of them is Tenebrae. At the cathedral, we do it on Good Friday evening, but in other parishes, it can be done at different days of the week. It's known as the service of shadows, where the lights are diminished and the darkness is increased. It began in the Middle Ages, centuries ago, this celebration of light and darkness, where the readings of salvation history were proclaimed that speak of the infidelity of God's people. You know, the more they were unfaithful, the more the darkness enveloped them. And the more they learned to be faithful and obedient, the light began to shine. This is a prolonged meditation on the anticipated coming of the suffering servant that was spoken about so powerfully in the prophet Isaiah. The extinguishing of those candles that are on the altar signify the rejection of God's people that happens in every age through our sin, our disobedience, our lack of fidelity to the commandments, we extinguish the light of faith in our own hearts and in the world. And the darkness can easily appear to be gaining ground. Sometimes it can be overwhelming. We live in an age today where our Christian faith is under attack. Our religious freedom, something we take for granted, isn't something we can take for granted any longer. The darkness of secularism is beginning to extinguish faith, light by light. The challenge, of course, is for people of faith to ignite and relight that lamp of faith by our passion, our faithfulness, by our good deeds. And that's what happens if you've been at Tenebrae, you know that as we read salvation history, the lights on the candelabra are extinguished until they're gone. Total darkness. And we have the beating of the drums, the strepitus, that signals the closing of the tomb. Jesus died for our sins. The darkness covered the earth, we hear in the gospel accounts on Good Friday but only for a time. And Tenebrae reminds us that the light of Jesus can never be extinguished completely. The celebrant of Tenebrae carries in the candle of Jesus and relights those candles on the altar. The return of the candle signifies the light of Christ, the light of the world that will never, ever be extinguished. Remember the beginning of the Gospel of John. He came as a light, a light that overcomes the darkness, and that light will never, ever be extinguished. A beautiful ritual in the life of the church that dates back to the Middle Ages. If you've never been to Tenebrae, it's powerful, it's emotional as we experience the darkness of our sins, the sadness and trials of life that can overwhelm us, are lifted up through the power and the grace of God's saving light. There are other Lenten rituals that we know mean so much to us. The Stations of the Cross, 14 of them, that we have identified through the various scripture accounts. The first stations really began to be prayed and practiced in the Middle Ages as well. St. Anthony of Padua, St. Alphonsus Liguori, whose stations we pray at the cathedral. St. Francis of Assisi, a way of identifying those significant moments on that final journey of Jesus 
as he made his way from that last supper through the Garden of Gethsemane to the Sanhedrin, to the torture and agony of his executioners to the tomb. Those 14 steps that were offered out of love for each of us, a beautiful devotion. They're prayed during Lent, but they can be prayed all year long. The stations of the cross that invite us to carry that cross of Jesus. Remember what he said, anyone who wants to come after me will need to take up his cross and follow in my steps. One of the other traditions you might notice behind you are the shrouding of the statues. Not every parish does that. It's an It's a rather ancient and traditional custom, but the cathedral has done it for quite a while. As we move from the fourth to the fifth Sunday of Lent into Holy Week, all of the statues are covered over as best as we can, and there are a lot of them. And so it's dramatic when we come to Mass. Nothing is left unshrouded except the crucifix, and the altar, where our focus should really be. Because at every Mass on that altar, the saving sacrifice of the cross is made present, and we are caught up in that mystery once again. The saving sacrifice of our redemption. That's what we're called to focus on in this Holy Week. Everything else is covered over, shrouded over. We don't want to be distracted. We're called to focus on the altar and the cross where Jesus willingly, obediently offered his life for our salvation. One of the other traditions briefly to mention is the Seder meal. Many of you have participated in that. You know, for us, the last Supper, Holy Thursday, is the new Passover. But Jesus gathered with his disciples to celebrate the Passover of the Jews. The feast that marked their freedom from slavery, their flight from Egypt to the new land promised by God. And that night they marked their doors with blood, blood of the Lamb. And the angel passed over the faithful ones and spared them death. And every year that Passover celebration speaks of that relationship of God's chosen people and their freedom from slavery to new life. And we know as people of faith that Jesus institutes the new Passover, the Eucharist, marked by his blood on the cross to set us free from sin and guide us to a new life. But everything we do is rooted in the foundations of the Old Testament. Remember Jesus said, I have come not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it, to bring it to a new meaning, a new life. And many of us can participate in the Seder service all of the prayers that mean so much to our liturgy, the symbolism of the herbs that speak to the trials and the sufferings of the the people of God, brought to new life and freedom through the grace of God. But we get to the Triduum, which is the real heart of Holy Week, the three days, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, leading to Easter, the Triduum. We begin those special three days with the celebration of the Chrism Mass. It's typically on Holy Thursday morning. It's been that way in our diocese for many, many years. But it can be offered at a different time in Holy Week particularly in those dioceses where priests have to travel hours and hours to get to the cathedral. We don't have that problem here in Pittsburgh. But I have classmates in the Midwest and in the South that have to travel six, eight, ten hours 
to be able to get to the cathedral and then back to their own parish. So sometimes Chrism Mass takes place on Monday of Holy Week or Tuesday. But the importance is that the bishop gathers with his priests and deacons on that very special day to remember the institution of the priesthood. To celebrate the sacrament of holy orders. You know, we can't have the Eucharist, we can't have Mass without priests. That's their primary duty. Many people think of priests doing many, many different things, and we do. It's a fact of life, but at the end of the day, the only important thing that we're ordained to do, they call them the three ministries of the ordained priest, whose highest fulfillment is the order of bishop, to sanctify God's people, to celebrate the sacraments. It's at the heart of who we are, to teach the faith, and to guide the people of God. Those are the three munera, the three missions of the ordained ministry, to sanctify, to teach, and to lead. And we celebrate on Holy Thursday the institution of the sacrament of holy orders. Jesus called men to be ordained and configured to him in every way, so that they would be able to carry on the work that he began. A beautiful celebration of what is at the heart of our faith. Jesus entrusted the sacraments to the priests to be carried on so that through their ministry they could heal and sanctify, celebrate the Mass, hear confessions, anoint the sick, bury the dead, baptize those into the life of the faith. Those moments that are so critical to enabling us to be joined to the life of the church. It's also the day that we bless and distribute the holy oils. The bishop at the Chrism Mass blesses those oils, three of them that are used in the administration of the sacraments. The holy chrism that is blessed by the bishop in a particular way because he needs to breathe his breath over those oils. You see the bishop bowing over the chrism after he has stirred in the perfume that brings fragrance and life to that oil. He breathes his spirit into that oil. That chrism is used at baptism, at confirmation. It's used in the anointing of priests and deacons. Just like it was in the Old Testament when that oil was poured over King David, the prophets, those chosen by God to proclaim his word and to lead his people. And we also bless on Holy Thursday at that Chrism Mass the oil of catechumens, which is used at baptism before the Chrism to set a person free from original sin. And we bless the oil of the sick that priests take to anoint people with the sacrament of the sick, those who suffer, those who are about to have surgery, those who are struggling with long-term illnesses and particularly for the viaticum when people are dying, that oil that brings them comfort and strength, the forgiveness of sins, healing and peace. And those oils are blessed that day and brought forward to be part of the liturgy and at the end of the Mass, every single parish is able to pick up those oils that they will need for that year 
to carry on the life of the church, the life of faith, a very powerful part of the Chrism Mass. As we said, those oils, just like the palms, are sacramentals. They can't be disposed of except in his sacred, dignified way. They have to be burned or buried. In every parish, there is an ambry. We have one over at the Sacred Heart altar where the oils are displayed and stored for the use throughout the year so that we can see them and remember that we are blessed as God's people to have those significant moments in life where we can receive grace through the means that God himself has established. A very beautiful celebration of the Chrism Mass. And part of that celebration of holy orders is that the priest will renew their priestly commitments that are made at the day of ordination, at the invitation of a bishop. We recommit ourselves to be configured to Jesus Christ, to offer our lives in service for the church, to be one like Jesus who willingly lays his life down in service to one another. Holy Thursday in the evening begins that sacred triduum, those very special blessed days that begin the passion and death of our Savior. And we begin with the Mass of the Lord's Supper. It's at that Mass that we celebrate the institution of the Holy Eucharist. We remember that Last Supper of Jesus with his disciples in the upper room where he broke the bread, gave thanks, and distributed it to those around him, where he blessed the cup of wine and gave it to his disciples to drink. Do this in memory of me. That's what the priest says at every Mass. And we don't just remember that event or recall it. For Catholics at every Mass, that event is made present. It's what we believe in the real presence, that in the Holy Eucharist, confected at every Mass through the blessing of the priest, Jesus is made present, truly present, in his flesh and blood, his soul and divinity. That's what sets Catholics apart from other Christians. We aren't just reenacting or remembering. It isn't bread and wine. After the consecration, it's the body and blood of Jesus. And when Catholics come forward to receive communion, the priest says the body of Christ or the blood of Christ And we need to respond with that Hebrew word, amen, which means literally, I believe, so it is. It's why we can't share communion with non-believers. We must profess our faith that this is the real presence of Jesus. And we receive Jesus in humility but we receive him as part of the church, we can't be separated from the church through mortal sin, through lack of belief. We can't be Catholic in name only and receive the Eucharist. We've got to be fully, completely part of the church. Yes, we're sinners, aware of our failures, but always striving to do better, to be led through grace, and our efforts to be fully part of the church. But we can't separate ourselves from what the church teaches and come forward for communion. It's a contradiction. In our hearts, we always have to be working to be one with Christ and all that he teaches. It's what communion means. And so we celebrate at the Mass of the Lord's Supper, the Holy Eucharist, and we do it in many different ways. The beautiful Mass that focuses on 
the Eucharist. And after communion, we process the Holy Eucharist through the church and repose that Eucharist in the tabernacle and allow the church to be open for a number of hours so that people can make pilgrimage. You know, Holy Thursday has the tradition of the seven church walk. It began in Rome where people literally walked to the seven major churches. It took all day. They began in the morning, ended in the evening. We do it more simply, perhaps in our car or on buses. But you know, seven is the perfect number in the Bible. It speaks to the divine trinity, the perfection that is God, seven. Seven times seven. Remember when Peter asked Jesus, how many times should I forgive? Seven? Jesus says 70 times seven. Those speak to our call to be perfect. And that seven church walk is an ability for us to go to seven different churches, offer our prayer, seek God's help. This year, of course, with the pandemic, we aren't able to do that. But privately, and certainly in the future, we might give consideration to that beautiful practice of the church to spend a few hours on Holy Thursday evening traveling to seven different churches, praying in front of the Blessed Sacrament, growing more deeply in our love for the real presence of Jesus and offering our prayers that God will give us strength and help in all that we do. Part of the Mass of the Lord's Supper, in addition to the focus on the Eucharist, is the mandatum. It's the gospel for the Holy Thursday celebration. What took place at the Last Supper in the upper room you might remember that account. Jesus got down on his hands and knees and washed the feet of his disciples. It was a custom in Jesus' time that anyone who sat to eat a meal would have their feet washed by the slaves, the servants, to make them clean. They had come in from walking, covered with dust, it was a slave's job to get down and wash the feet of his master and the guests. But Jesus does exactly that. Remember, Peter was appalled by what Jesus did. You will never wash my feet. And Jesus says, if I don't wash your feet, you will never gain eternal life. But those words of Holy Thursday are words for us to reflect on. If you remember what Jesus said, as I have done, so you must do. I have come not to be served, but to serve. It's the call of Christian faith. We live in a world today that is so self-centered. It's all about me, what I need, what I want. You know, we have a lot of people today who can only be happy when they think of themselves. It's not the Christian way. We're called to be selfless, to put aside all of our own interests and desires. It's not about me, it's about God, it's about others. Love of God and love of neighbor. And we know what Jesus teaches. Our neighbor is not the person we love or who we get along with or who we like. Our neighbor is the person we don't like, who's treated us badly, who's made judgments about us. How well do we love our enemy? That's the call of Holy Thursday, to get down on our knees and wash the feet of those that we are called to serve. It's a challenge every day. We might think of Mother Teresa, who's now a saint, who lived in the slums of Calcutta. 
Many people came to visit Mother Teresa. They couldn't believe what she did. They would ask her, how, how can you do that? What is your secret? Teach us how to love like you love. And Mother Teresa said, it's very simple. It isn't hard. Every day, when I look into the face of the person in front of me, I see Jesus Christ. I try to see the Lord. And isn't that a beautiful piece of wisdom? We don't see our enemy. We don't see someone who annoys us, who's treated us badly. We don't see someone that we really can't forgive. Every person bears the imprint of Jesus, a son and daughter of God. Can we not try to love them? as we love Jesus Christ. That's what Mother Teresa says. As I have done, you must do. That's what we celebrate. This Holy Thursday, we won't be washing feet because of the coronavirus restrictions and trying to keep everyone safe and respect the distancing, but it's part of the ritual of the church. And even though we can't do it this year, Perhaps each of us in our own way can work more diligently to make the meaning of that ritual alive in our hearts, in our lives and our homes. As I have done, you must do. To offer our lives in loving service to others. And after that Mass on Holy Thursday, everything is taken away. Everything is stripped away the candles, the altar cloths, everything is left bare. The tabernacle remains open and empty in anticipation of that death of Jesus on the cross for Good Friday. We begin to enter the most solemn day in the life of our Christian faith. The day that Jesus offered his life on the cross, Good Friday. There is a ritual that we participate in at the cathedral that begins every year at 12 o'clock. We hope you'll join us. The seven last words of Jesus. You know, we can only imagine the number of, of words that Jesus spoke in his life over those 33 years of living. How many words did the Lord speak that we don't even know about? But in the gospel accounts, there are seven last words that complete the Lord's life on earth. Very important words. Words that teach and inspire and reveal to us really what was at the heart of our Lord and Savior. Those seven last words are part of our reflection on Good Friday where the words are proclaimed and we can reflect on them and begin to walk that journey to Calvary. The Good Friday service begins immediately after those seven last words, usually taking place in our parishes. At some point in the mid-afternoon, the priest again wear red vestments, a sign of the passion and blood of our Savior. And it begins most notably and powerfully in silence. And the bishop and priest prostrate themselves on the floor of the cathedral. We only do that at our ordination, where we lay face down on the floor in humility reflecting on that call to complete total abandonment to God's will, we do it again on Good Friday, emptying ourselves of everything as we recall the Lord's passion, his laying down his life completely for our salvation. And the heart of our Good Friday service is the word, the word of Jesus those scripture readings that foreshadow and foretell of what will happen in the sending of the suffering servant, 
and how he will be rejected and tortured by men. And every Good Friday, we read the Passion from the Gospel of John, a powerful account, again detailing every event of that journey that Jesus takes from that entry into Jerusalem until the death on the cross at Golgotha and the burial in the tomb. And when we reflect on that passion and kneel down in silence when Jesus dies on the cross, we're called to open our hearts to that gift of such love, selfless, unconditional love poured out on us for the forgiveness of sins. John 3.16 it summarizes the whole of our faith. If there's any passage to remember in the scriptures, it's John 3.16. God so loved the world that he emptied himself, sent his son to die on the cross so that all who believe in him will be saved, will have life. And after those powerful accounts of God's word. We pray for the church. We pray for others. We pray for non-believers. The great intercessions of the church that are offered on Good Friday. For those in public office, for our Jewish brothers and sisters, for those who have no faith, for the sick, the suffering, for the dying. The church prays for all who are part of the body of Christ and we lift them up through the power of the cross, through the intercession of Jesus to our Heavenly Father. And perhaps the most poignant and emotional moment of that Good Friday service for many is the veneration of the cross. The cross of Jesus is carried from the back of the cathedral to the front Behold the wood of the cross upon which hung the Savior of the world. We have the opportunity to gaze on the crucifix. And you know, that's the call of faith, to keep our eyes fixed on the cross of Jesus, never to lose sight of that saving sacrifice. Nothing matters more in our lives than to believe in the one who laid down his life for our salvation. And we're invited to venerate that cross. Usually, we kiss the cross or touch the cross. It's so important to us, but not this year. Because of the pandemic, it will be difficult. It may not be comfortable for us, but we're invited to genuflect, to bow out of concern for the safety of everyone. But maybe by not being able to kiss the cross or touch the cross, we might even come to embrace it more deeply. You know, what we can't have is something that we long for even more. We should never take for granted that opportunity given to us every year to kneel at the foot of the cross. How many people were left? Almost none. St. John, the mother of Jesus, Mary, our virgin mother, and a few others, everyone else had left. Who stands at the foot of the cross? Each of us is called to do exactly that. And the veneration of the cross invites us to stand with Jesus in his suffering, in his death, to offer all that we have to offer in our lives so that we can be lifted up by the strength of that gift. And after the veneration of the cross, we're able to receive Holy Communion. Good Friday is the only day of the year that no Mass can be celebrated out of love for the fact that Jesus died on the cross. There's no Mass celebrated in any church in any part of the world on Good Friday. 
but we can receive communion because it's the life-giving strength of every Catholic, every believer. And we consecrate enough communion of Holy Thursday to be able to distribute Holy Communion on Good Friday. We can't be denied the gift of Jesus' own body and blood. And finally, we move to the Easter Vigil and Easter Sunday. And I know our time is moving along, but I briefly wanted to talk about those uh, celebrations in our rituals of Holy Week. The Easter Vigil is such a powerful, beautiful opportunity for us to move from the death of Jesus on the cross to the resurrection, the new life. We begin in darkness, the darkness of the cross, all the lights extinguish. And we bless the fire at the back of the church. The fire that brings the light of energy and power and strength of that resurrection into the life of the church. We bless that fire and bless the Paschal candle that's carried in and all the other candles that we hold are lit. The light of Jesus has come back into the world through the resurrection. And we sing the exalted, the proclamation of our salvation history, our faith, the power of, of God's love over death, over sin, over evil. That night is filled with such hope, such joy. Nothing can ever defeat those who keep their faith in Jesus Christ. Nothing at all. No trial, no suffering, no struggle, no disappointment, no sin, no evil, no darkness. You know, people today worry about so much. Christians don't worry. We have no anxieties. God is with us. He'll take care of the world. He'll take care of us. He calls us to faith, to strong, enduring faith. And we read the scriptures from the book of Genesis, the creation of the world, to Exodus, the fleeing from slavery into new life, to the prophet Isaiah, the invitation to drink of the water of faith, moving into the experience of the new covenant, the word of Jesus. We sing the Gloria finally with the bells, that hymn that we haven't said all through Lent. Our discipline has refrained us from singing those alleluias and the glorias, and now we ring the bells, we proclaim that hymn. We call on the saints to bless the church, we bless the holy water that will now be sprinkled on us as a sign of our baptism. And those who are coming into the church are welcomed at the Easter Vigil. They've made the journey. The catechumens who will be baptized, the candidates who will make their profession of faith every year, people who have been on the journey to join the church are welcomed that night. And we too renew our baptismal promises and are sprinkled with the Easter water. Easter Vigil, Easter Sunday, a joyous proclamation of all that we believe, the central greatest day of the Christian faith. When we proclaim the resurrection of our Savior, the Lord of life, the one who has conquered sin and death for all. I wanted to mention just a few things about the Easter season and then see if we might have any, any questions uh, this evening. So, one of the questions I receive all the time is, how do we know when Easter is celebrated? And there's no easy answer. There's an old formula of the church. Easter is celebrated on the first Sunday following the full moon that occurs on or just after the spring equinox. That's been in place since the second century. It's a movable feast. 
Roman Catholics follow the Gregorian calendar and Eastern Orthodox churches follow the Julian calendar, which is why our Easter celebrations are on different days. But basically, the spring equinox has been determined by the church to be on March 21st. So after March 21st, the first full moon, which this year fell on March 28th, following that, the next Sunday, which is April 4th, which is why we celebrate April on April 4th. And so it's a movable feast based on a formula that existed from the very beginning of the church. We know that the Easter celebration is so important to us that we have an octave. You know, if you look at the baptismal font, something that people don't realize, take a close look at most baptismal, baptismal fonts. They have eight sides. It's an octagon. Seven days of creation, and the eighth day is the day of resurrection. Eight days. The fulfillment of all of God's promises. And so for every major feast in the church, there's an octave. And Easter begins on Easter Sunday and ends on that Saturday before Divine Mercy Sunday. Eight days. Every day is like Easter. We sing a Gloria. We do the Creed. Every day is Easter Sunday. That's how important Easter is. And so if some of you are not fully confident about coming to Mass on Easter Sunday, you can come on Easter Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. It's still Easter Sunday. Come during the week. The octave is celebrated like it is Easter Sunday. So important. Eight days that we celebrate like Easter. And you all know that at the end of Mass for the Easter season that goes for 50 days. We add Alleluia, Alleluia to the final dismissal. Go in peace, Alleluia, Alleluia. A way of reminding us of the joy of this season. And the Paschal candle is situated right by the altar, the ambo where we proclaim the word to focus our attention on the light of Christ. 50 days of Easter, Easter Sunday to Pentecost, where we in the church celebrate the new life of faith and grace given to us by the resurrection of our Savior. Some of you that come to Mass every day know that at 12 o'clock we pray the Angelus, the great prayer of the church, the prayer of Mary, but not during Easter. We pray the Regina Cheli, Another wonderful prayer that speaks to Mary as the Easter witness. The Queen of Heaven, Queen of Earth, the one who has testified to the risen Savior, another sign that this season is blessed and different from the ordinary time of the church. And Easter comes to an end on Divine Mercy Sunday, the second Sunday of Easter, a feast that was put in place by Pope John Paul II, who had a great devotion to Divine Mercy, a devotion promoted by Sister Faustina, whom Pope John Paul II had a great admiration. That image of Jesus, the rays of love flowing from his open heart, his arms extended to each of us, inviting us to experience the forgiveness of our sins, the grace that comes to all who look to Jesus Christ, and the opportunity to live in the fullness of the resurrection. A beautiful way that we can end our Easter season. And so there we have the rituals of Holy Week, those um, rituals that mean so much, they're so rich, we take them for granted, we may not even understand them all. But hopefully tonight, and just kind of walking through with me the journey that we take, you might give a little bit more attention to what we do 
and remember why we do it. You know, one of the great signs of, of Easter is holy water. And it will be blessed on Easter Sunday at the vigil. We will be sprinkled as we renew our baptismal promises. But unfortunately, because of the pandemic, we can't distribute holy water. We're so used to blessing ourselves as we come and go or taking holy water home. We can't do that out of fear of passing on the virus to others. But perhaps as we reflect on something like that, that we take for granted, that is so easily accessible to us, perhaps we might grow more deeply in our appreciation of holy water. I think for all of us, for a time when we couldn't come back to Mass, when the churches were closed, just a year ago, there was no celebration of Holy Week. Everything was shut down in the diocese. What a difference a year makes. The hope is, of course, that we might grow more deeply in our affection, our understanding, our appreciation of the things of faith that are so very, very important to us that at times we may not be able to access. We can never take them for granted. May we grow more deeply in our longing, our devotion, our love for the practices and rituals of our faith. And I pray that you'll join us. You'll join us this Holy Week. All of the celebrations will be open and accessible to the public except the Chrism Mass, which is closed to just the bishop and the priest. But everything will be live streamed on Facebook, on our website. We'll be broadcasting all of the liturgies on Channel 95. So join us in person or join us virtually as we now begin to celebrate and focus on the central mysteries of our faith the death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I believe I've answered all of the questions that have come to me this evening. You're always free to email me or to call the rectory or to, to write. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. I'm very grateful for your attention this evening, for taking the time to join me. We will gather together at the end of, of April for a talk on sacramentals and devotions. And if you have any favorite devotions or prayers or things that you might be interested in, please email me ahead of time and I'm happy to incorporate them in what I will be talking about. May God bless you, your family. Please stay safe. May you have a very blessed and, and holy Easter. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Lord, thank you for being with us this evening, for this opportunity to talk and to reflect on the mysteries of our faith. As we begin to walk this Holy Week with your Son, Jesus Christ, may our hearts be open more deeply to your saving word, to your divine grace, to your mercy. Free us from our sins, Help us to grow in love for you and others. We pray that this Easter will be a source of great blessing for our families, for those in need, for all of those who suffer, for those who have fallen away from the church, those who have addictions, all of those who struggle in any way, we lift them up to you through the power of your cross. We give you thanks and praise through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God bless you all and have a very blessed and holy, holy week and a blessed Easter.